Hi, my name is Andrew Bennett, and I'm an advisor with the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors. Tonight, I'll be talking about agricultural mapping using drones and satellites, and especially we'll be focusing on low-cost options that I've found have really big benefits when farms are making plans or keeping records. The Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors is a free service to farms in the southeast of British Columbia. So if you're a farm in our region, please do give us a call about any technical issues you may have, and we'll do what we can to help find experts uh, who have the right answers to the questions that you're looking for. If you'd like to connect with me about any of the topics that I present on tonight, feel free. My number is right there, or my email. Call me anytime. We're going to start off with some of the least expensive drone options. I've been flying a Mavic Mini for about a year now, and we'll be talking about the next step up, the Mavic Mini 2. There's also satellite data that's available for free that you can use to turn into vegetation indices that will give a really good picture of how your crops are growing through the season. The Mini 2. I have a Mini 1, it's great, it's only got a 3 kilometer range. The Mini 2 really ups the game. 10 kilometer range, better camera, better overall value for a couple hundred dollars more. So $800, you're going to get it all in, the Fly More combo that's got extra batteries, a case, extra propellers, all the things that you'll need. It's really a great little tool, it'll give you a bird's eye view to help check up on your farm help out with marketing videos, keep farm records. It can get it all done for the lowest price that you can find a decent drone for. I've been using it for mapping. It's not ideal for that purpose, but with a high aerial photo, you can stitch together 2D base maps or even get three-dimensional models. And we'll go through that quickly here in a moment. One of the best things about the minis is that they're less than 250 grams which means that you can fly them without a license. The only regulation on small drones or these micro drones is, eh, to paraphrase, don't do anything stupid. There's no reason you can't piece together your own drone, as a lot of people in the FPV or first person view racing drone community do as a hobby. You can buy all kinds of parts and solder them together, get yourself the fancy goggles, It'll still cost you about $1,000 if you want something long range that'll get you over, say, 5 kilometers range. Most racing drones only have a 500 meter range, which is good for flying around a park, but if you're trying to check out your farm and get some aerial photos, that won't work for you. I've used the Mavic Mini to make a number of base maps using basic stitching software. I'll fly the Mini quite high in the sky, take some aerial photos, as many as I need to cover the land, and then I'll stitch them together later in uh, Panorama Stitcher is what I use. You can take a map like this and there'll be some distortions because of lens effects and all kinds of other reasons. And to make it actually match the map view, you'll need to use ground control points, or I just use landmarks that I can see in Google Earth and in my photograph. And you can stretch that photograph to correctly match the dimensions on the ground. It's called georeferencing, and one of the best softwares to do this in is QGIS, which I'll talk about a little bit later. You can also do this using Add Image Overlay in Google Earth. Uh, it's not quite as accurate, uh, but it is a whole lot better than just using the photograph on its own, where if you try and measure distances, they may not be accurate. I made this map of a farm in Rock Creek just stitching together a few aerial photographs in a program called Maps Made Easy, which is a free program so long as you stay below a certain data limit, a certain number of photos, a certain number of pixels. It's totally free, you just have to get enough photographs and there has to be enough overlap between them, something we'll discuss in a minute. But you can see that you can import this into Google Earth and get a three-dimensional view. You can also output what's known as a digital elevation model, a DEM, and use that to get contours. What's crucial is that you get enough overlap on your photographs. This is exactly like stereoscopic vision, where when you're looking with your eyes at something, you see the same point with both eyes at the same time, which lets your brain 
triangulate on that point and roughly calculate the distance to that point. It's how we get depth perception. It's the same way with aerial photographs. When you're flying over, you need to have photographs that capture the same point on the ground from multiple angles so that the photogrammetric software can calculate the elevation of that point. If you want higher accuracy, you're going to need more overlapping photos. If you want better resolution, you'll need to fly at a lower altitude so that your camera's pixels pick up more detail in the ground. If you want both accuracy and good resolution, you'll need more photographs. And that means more data, and that might push you out of the free option on Maps Made Easy. You'll have to pay a little for the data processing. I don't want to just plug Maps Made Easy. There's plenty of other uh, programs out there, such as uh, Drone Deploy. And all of these programs allow you to fly in autopilot. That is, you can plan your mission in advance and decide where your drone will go and where the photographs will go. It will automatically come back when it runs out of batteries so you can switch out battery packs and fly up and continue the mission. You can go through multi-battery multi missions. It's really fantastic. The only problem is you can't do this with a Mavic Mini. You'll need to get a bigger drone such as the Mavic Pro 2 or any number of drones that are supported by that kind of software. This is about as inexpensive as I've been able to find, though, with this mapping option, you're looking at about $2,000. It's got a great camera, fantastic range, but it's over the 250 gram limit, so you are going to need to get a license. That license is good to fly anything up to 25 kilos, so if you're trying to fly one of Chris Noski's large spray drones, the same license is going to hold for you. You need permits beyond the 25 kilogram limit. Licensing is not a big deal. Don't worry too much about it. It's just a written test for most of us to get a basic license. Unless you need to fly near an airport. If your farm's near an airport, you will need to get an advanced license, which requires an in-person flight test. I found it useful to buy into a study guide program where there are tests that can help you prepare for the written test. I found all the information extremely useful and uh, fascinating, really. I would, I recommend the three-year study guide access. It's $50 well spent. You can also prepare yourself on YouTube. These guys I found handy. I'm sure there's a plenty more out there. Winged drones are really useful on big farms where you're trying to cover a lot of territory. In this test, for example, at half inch resolution, the Wingtra drone here compared to a, a standard quadcopter drone was able to cover 10 times the area on a single battery. At one inch resolution, the Wingtra can cover a thousand acres in an hour. That's really great if you've got a big farm. But don't take my word for it. John Church is right about all things drone, and he says that there's quadcopters out there that can turn their props now and can act like a winged drone and can do everything this drone can do and carry a heavier payload. Such as LiDAR. LiDAR is using lasers to get the shape of the Earth. It's extremely precise and it's extremely expensive. This one uh, was $50,000 when I looked it up. John Church says that there's some available from DJI now uh, where the entire package is $30,000. Uh, usually if you need this level of resolution for a base map, you'll probably just want to hire it out. But it is very handy to have LiDAR because it can penetrate most canopies and give you the actual ground surface where a typical drone photographed map is going to just give you the visual boundaries. So if you've got trees, it will give you the elevation of the tree canopy rather than the ground itself. Of course, the way I try and get around that usually is I'll try and fly a mapping mission in the spring or in the late fall when the leaves are down. Okay, let's get out of the expensive options and into the free options. 
satellite imagery. This is for a completely different purpose, and we're going to be talking about vegetation indices next. This is all free, 30 meter resolution on NASA's Landsat satellites, 10 meter resolution on the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellite. You can get maps like this on plant vigor. The greener the map, the more healthy and productive the vegetation, the redder the map, the less vegetation. Or sometimes it's because it's water or a road or a cloud. That's stuff that we have to interpret. I downloaded these maps from Sentinel-2 to look at this farm in Rock Creek. And let me highlight a few things. When I talked to the farmer about this map, he was impressed because the areas of dark versus light really reflect the difference in productivity that he found. He got a lot more bales from the dark areas, um, like here and here, and way fewer bales in the light areas. And he was able to look down at each of these pixels, which are actually 20 by 20 meters, and really felt that it reflected his his land's productivity. So that is exactly what this satellite imagery is good for. Here, July 27th, this was after first cut. Uh, and you can see, of course, it's a redder image because there was less vegetation on the ground. Over here, where it's dark red, this had been tilled up. This is cultivated for a, for a cover crop that was going in. Can't remember quite the details, but again, it reflects very accurately the degree to which the plants were vigorous on the land. You can get much higher resolution with similar imagery from a drone, but you're going to need a fancy camera, something that can photograph the red edge or near infrared. And we'll talk about those in just a moment here. We're looking at a camera though that will cost a minimum of $2,500. This may come down in the future as more people are taking multi-spectral images. We'll see. That camera I showed you before might do the trick. This one definitely will. It's a $10,000 camera. So yes, we're talking about super fancy cameras when we're talking multi-spectral. And we want that red edge and near infrared. The next step up is hyperspectral when we're talking about 100 bands or John Church has one that photographs 450 different bands, not just in the visual, but outside of the visual range. And we'll see why this is important in a moment, but you can use these spectra to identify species, rock types, soil types, moisture levels, all kinds of possibility, but it's still in the research and development stage, and this is really way beyond what would be useful to a farm at the moment. It's also outside of most people's budgets. John's drone, for example, and that camera cost half a million dollars. Okay, let's take a quick review on what multispectral even means. What is a light wave again? Let's start with the sunshine here. It puts out a spectrum that goes beyond just the visible. So here's the visible going from you know, purple at one end up to red at the other with blue, green, yellow, and orange in the middle. That's what we can see. And you can tell from this graph that it is the most abundant number of light waves coming out of the sun. That's the brightest part of the sun spectrum is right in that visible range. But it's also putting out a ton of rays in the ultraviolet and over here in the infrared. Higher energy, shorter wavelengths, gamma rays and x-rays at this end and lower energy, longer wavelength, microwaves and radio waves out beyond the infrared. Remember here, UV rays are the ones that give you cancer. Infrared are the ones that will warm you up on a hot day at the beach, which sounds good right about now. And the near infrared are those bands that are really close to the visible. That's why it's, it's near, it's near to the visible. We can spread that out here on, on this and we can see the spectrum that we can see is here and out there, invisible to us, is the near infrared. So, how do we use these spectra to our advantage? What does this relate to vegetation health? It comes down to how every single object absorbs and reflects light differently. That's why if you have a hyperspectral camera, you can use those minute differences to really parse out 
what kind of species or what kind of rock or what kind of soil. But we're just looking at fairly broad bands here, the near infrared and the red. That's what's key to us. We're going to be comparing those two in a vegetation index. But how does that work? Well, let's focus in on a healthy leaf versus a stressed leaf. Okay, we'll start with a dead leaf. A dead leaf is reflecting all the wavelengths about equally. And when you mix all those red, greens, and blues together in an equal amount, it comes out brown, just like my paintings in kindergarten. That's great. It's brown. We can see that from the air. We don't need multispectral imagery to see a dead leaf. But a stressed leaf and a healthy leaf are both going to be reflecting green fairly similarly. If you're a horticulturalist and you can look at a leaf that's healthy and stressed, you're going to be able to tell which one is stressed and which one is healthy. But from the air, it's a lot less apparent. They all look fairly green. What's different is that a stressed leaf reflects far less in the near-infrared than a healthy leaf. A healthy leaf reflects far more near-infrared. So when we compare how much near-infrared is reflected versus how much red, and we compare that, that's the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, the NDVI. It's just the difference between near-infrared and red. When that difference is high, it's a healthy leaf. When the difference is low, it's a stressed leaf or even a dead leaf. To know why we're reflecting mostly in the green here, it's because blue and red are eaten by the leaf in photosynthesis. Those are the frequencies or the wavelengths that are most useful for that chlorophyll to eat. The green is mostly not used by chlorophyll, so it bounces back and that's why chlorophyll or the, uh, the molecule that makes plants green looks green. Okay, so how do we get this data? First, let's take a look at what's out there. And it's a little bit complicated. We'll just take this step at a time. Again, I'll focus in here. We've got Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, and Landsat-7. These are the three different satellites that we're getting multispectral data from. In each satellite, there's a whole pile of different cameras on board. Each of these squares is a different band that's getting photographed. So you can see that there are many different ones to choose from. The ones we're mostly interested in are in the red band and the near-infrared band. So here I've expanded out the visible spectrum to the near-infrared and shown the Sentinel-2 bands that match up with that. And you can see that you'll want to have a band 4 for the red and band 8 for the near infrared. There's also this 567 and 8A. 567 are red edge bands and 8A is a narrower near infrared band. These Sentinel-2 has available at 20 meter accuracy whereas 2, 3, 4 and 8 are available in 10 meter accuracy. You can mix and match these to get all kinds of different uh, indices that will tell you different things about your plants. That's a, quite a science on its own. If you want to geek out though, you could probably find out some interesting things about your farm. For most of us, we just want to compare the near infrared to the red and get a decent vegetation index. I'll show you in a moment how I have been getting this data, but I learned recently that there might have been another way using the now free membership that any farm can get with the Farmer's Business Network. I heard you could also get free satellite data, so I signed up my own farm. And sure enough, yes, you can get free satellite data updated all the time for your farm. Only for your farm. So there's a bunch of reasons why you might still want to download whole data sets, but this is as easy as it gets. You sign up, you draw the, uh, where your farms are on the map. For example, this is one of the parcels I lease to graze my goats. And it will take about a day to upload and you will have satellite imagery from the Sentinel-2 satellite updated regularly. Now there can be some problems. You don't get access to Landsat. Now Landsat is a lower resolution satellite, but it can be very helpful because Sentinel-2 and Landsat are on different cycle periods around the world. 
If Sentinel-2 is going over your farm only when it's cloudy, you're not going to have access to any imagery because when it's cloudy, you get nothing. For example, here, I have no data for June or July because it was cloudy on those days that the Sentinel-2 satellite was passing over. So I have May, August, and September. When I go into Landsat data, I can get some images from June and July that don't have clouds. You may also want to be able to compare your land to your neighbor's land. And if you have uh, satellite imagery for a whole area, you can look over and see what the vegetation indices are on a similar, um, a similar piece of land that your friend uh, next door is farming. And you can compare how those vegetation indices match up. So it's not very flexible, it's only for your farm. You can only get the EVI, which is essentially the same as the NDVI. EVI is Enhanced Vegetation Index. It's the same thing. It's just the near-infrared minus the red. The actual equation, as you can see in the bottom corner there, is a little bit more complicated. It's the same thing. These are all basic vegetation vigor indices. Here's the other way that you can get the data for free with the Earth Explorer, which is offered by the United States Geological Survey. This is a great little website. Um, all you have to do is go there and zoom in on your farm. Once you're zoomed in, click on Use Map, and you will have an area delineated on the map that shows the area that you are interested in. And that will help limit the data that comes back to only satellite imagery that covers your farm. Set a certain date range. So for example, here I went from May 1st to September 30th so that I could get all the data that came last year's, uh, in last year's season uh, from spring to fall. And I also reduced cloud cover range from zero to 50%. I might even recommend against that, keep it at 100%. This eliminates any results that have more than 50% cloud cover. You'll, I'll show you in a moment how you can just zoom in on each of the results to see if clouds are actually covering your farm. First though, you want to get the data by setting a pre-filter. You check that box, that helps eliminate all the data that's out there that's available to farms in the United States, but isn't available to us in Canada. And you'll be able to then check on Landsat and Sentinel. There's other data sets available out there, and if you're a total geek, uh, get to it. It's great fun. Um, if you're not, Landsat and Sentinel, that's all you need. When you get to the data, the, the results, um, you'll want to click on the footprint or overlay buttons to see where that satellite image is. And as you can see from the image here, the satellite is covering a vast area. It's covering a lot of northern Washington and Idaho, as well as the southern uh, Southern British Columbia. There's the farm in red. And you can see the clouds on it. So for each of these uh, images that come up in your results, you can click on overlay, zoom in on your farm and see if a cloud's covering it or not. And then you'll want to download the stuff that doesn't have a cloud covering it. The download options can look a little confusing. You can download everything, but as we mentioned, there's a lot of bands there that aren't useful to you. All you're really interested in are the red band and the near infrared band. So for example, this is for Landsat 8. Band 5 is the near infrared and band 4 is the red. I also download bands 3, which is green, and bands 2, band 2, which is blue. Because you can put the blue, green, and red together to make a true color image. And that's useful if you want to know when you're looking at your vegetation index, if it was a lake or a cloud or soil that, uh, that might be giving you that red signal back from the vegetation index. Now it's time to make a map. The freest way to do this is with QGIS or quantum GIS. That's geographic information systems. This is a really fantastic program. It's come a long way in the last 20 years. Uh, I used to find it almost impossible to use. Now it's much more user friendly and extremely powerful. You can do all kinds of mapping and processing of different data for your farm on this, but it is a big learning curve. 
If you are interested in QGIS and you want to talk to me about this more, feel free to give me a call at the Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisors. We can talk about how to get you started with QGIS. Otherwise, just know that it's out there. There's plenty of YouTubes, plenty of forums. Uh, uh, dive right in. Great project maybe for next winter. It is what I use to upload that satellite imagery and turn it into the vegetation indices. And that's about what I have for you today. Uh, quick review, there's plenty of free information out there, free satellite data, free softwares that you can use to analyze your satellite data or your drone footage. The drones, I'd really recommend starting out with something cheap and easy like the Mavic Mini 2 for about 800 bucks and you can go up from there. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to hearing from you soon.